Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We are going to look at the final book of our children's literature class, which is Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi. Um, I chose this book for you because... It really, as you can see by this cover, which I love, and I wish the American version had this cover, um, but the book really moves through um, Satrapi's almost her entire life. It is a true story, and it is her biography, even though, or her memoir, rather, though it is a graphic novel, and it starts when she's five. A lot of it focuses on her life as a child around the age of 10, 11, part one. And then part two, we see her as a teenager and then as a young adult. So one of the reasons that I chose it as the last book in our series is because we, it's, it's marked as a young adult book and, it, and certainly it's a wonderful book for young adults, but we do also see a little bit of a, a new adult, um, spin here as as Mar Jane um, or Margie as she's calls herself in the book moves into young adulthood um, after college. So an overview of the first part of Persepolis. Some pictures here. The top one straight out of the book. The second one down here is uh, adapted from the book for the movie version, which I do recommend watching as well. Um, so Persepolis, it's a graphic autobiography. So I'm going to use the word novel, but it's not exactly a novel. It's a graphic autobiography by Marjane Satrapi. It depicts her childhood up to her early, again, new adult years in Iran during and after the Islamic Revolution. The title Persepolis is a reference to the ancient capital of the Persian the Persian Empire, Persepolis. Um, the book has sold more than 2 million copies worldwide. The first part was written in 2000. The second part was written in 2004. Typically, this is together as one book, which is what I have assigned to you, the complete Persepolis, as opposed to part one and part two. And as I said, it's also been made into a movie. So part one begins in the 1970s. It focuses on Margie's youth during the Islamic Revolution in Iran. We're going to talk about what happened there and her take on it in just a couple minutes. So Margie is part of an upper middle class family. She's exposed to a lot of Western political thoughts and ideas, as well as some communist ideologies at a very young age. But she doesn't fully understand these and she kind of gets caught up in um in some of the movements. She's inspired to demonstrate against the Shah when she is quite young. I think by that point she's maybe about 10. Um, but later when religious extremists don't bring the revolution that was promised, she struggles to navigate in her new society. So this is one of the reasons that I pair this book with The Giver and Gathering Blue. We again have a, an individual who's teenage rebellious years are kind of mirrored by the fact that there are problems in society and she wants to see those problems solved. However, again, this is a little um, more realistic than, than dystopian fiction, which is not. Um, when war is declared with Iraq, um, Iraq invades Iran just after the revolution takes place. So Margie and her family rebel against the new regime in increasingly dangerous ways, drinking alcohol, which would have been um, illegal. Not Margie doesn't drink alcohol, but her parents do at that point. She starts to skip school. She wears non-approved clothing. She buys things on the black market um, as like a 10, 11 year old. And these are kind of her ways of fighting oppression. She also faces trauma. Um, we talked about that with Joey Pigza, and here it's even more apparent because she really is living in a war-torn country. Um, people are imprisoned, tortured, murdered, and unlike the other books that we've read so far, this is depicted in pretty graphic terms. So it's not off page. They tell what happens during the torture. Now, you don't see it um, as much uh, as much because this is a graphic novel, but we do see some of it and certainly we hear about it. So she's hearing about these things at an even younger age 
Um, she sees bombed buildings. She sees um, dead bodies. She hears about incidents. And these really cause her quite a bit of emotional pain. So in part two, um, her parents are worried about her because she is a strong female and a lot of women's rights are being taken away at this point. Um, they are concerned for her safety. They travel to Europe and they feel like that would be a better place for her. So they send her to Vienna. And at first she lives with her mother's friend because her parents want her to get an education. They worry for her safety. And again, because of her rebellious spirit. She struggles with authority even more in Vienna than she did in Iran. Um, partially, I think, because of the trauma, partially because of her um, personality <laughs> and partially because of the time period in which she's living. So she moves to a boarding house. Um, at one point she's in a school run by nuns. She very often gets angry at authority figures, yells at them. And eventually she goes through a physical and ideological transformation. She really shows um, there are a couple, I will call them almost montages, where you see her physically, her physical appearance changes. She cuts her hair, she starts smoking, she starts doing drugs, she starts drinking. Um, for a period of time, she's homeless. She struggles to stay in school and focus on her studies and make her parents proud. So Margie returns to Iran after four years, but she faced more trauma in Austria Um I almost said Australia. Sorry, guys. She faced trauma in Austria while living in Vienna. And she really, um, for a while in the book, refuses to talk about what she's been through. She's depressed. She's kind of suicidal. And she struggles to fit in socially with the girls who used to be her friends. Now she has very little in common with them. And they are living lives that are quite different from the one that she's been living, where she's had almost complete freedom. They've had almost complete authoritarian control and oppression. Um, eventually she meets a man Reza and begins dating him in kind of a Western manner, which gets them into trouble. So they're seen holding hands, um, which th then they're threatened with being imprisoned. Their parents have to pay money. Um, eventually she has to make decisions about her relationship, her life in Iran, whether she's going to stay there or whether she's going to leave, what's going to happen to her and Reza. So, before I talk about the developmental changes we see and how they meet and reflect the needs of readers, I want to give you a little bit of historical background. If you have taken my sci-fi class, I gave some of this historical background when I talk about The Handmaid's Tale. Um, if you haven't taken that course, I really recommend that you, um, this book is a great pairing with The Handmaid's Tale. The Handmaid's Tale is an adult book and I just taught it for my other class so I didn't want to assign that here but if you like Persepolis, The Handmaid's Tale is a great um, a great book to read along with that. I can't tell you about the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale because I haven't read it yet but it is on my list. At any rate, the historical background. So before 1978, the Shah of Iran attempted to westernize the country. Um, Iran had a lot of revenues from oil and economic growth. They also had high rates of government spending and inflation. They experimented before that with parliamentary democracy. And I, I put this here because I want to be upfront. I think a lot of the problems we've had in the Middle East are because of our own doing. So in 1953, there was a coup um, that was backed, I wouldn't say led by the CIA, I shouldn't have put that word there, but it was at least backed financially by the CIA, and it overthrew the prime minister. Um, if I leave the comments open, people are probably going to debate me on whether or not um, exactly happened there. Again, I don't want to go into so much detail here, but I want to give you just an overview. So the country had parliamentary democracy for a period of time. Um, the United States wanted better relations with, uh, in terms of oil and all of that. And so the prime minister was overthrown. The Shah of Iran 
kind of like a king, um, in some ways tried to westernize the country and was favorable to um, the Western ideas, the United States into Europe, but also oppressed many other political parties. So there starts to be some unrest or there continues to be some unrest because of that oppression, because basically what you have is a king taking taxes from people, um, spending crazy amounts of money. In Throughout the 1960s, um, westernized and secular practices were put into place. So the veil was banned. Um, women's rights were extended. So extrajudicial ju- divorce was ended. Extrajudicial divorce means that a man can just say to his wife, I divorce you without having to go through proper procedures. So there was an end put to that. Um, the age of consent was raised to 18, um, meaning that a girl could no longer be just married off at the age of 13. The right to vote was given to women. Um, abortion was allowed in cases of rape, and there was a restriction on polygamy. So you can kind of see... <coughs> sorry. You can kind of see up top, that's what Iran looked like. Um I could tell you that that's a picture from California from the 1960s. It really wouldn't look any different. Or at least not that much different. Women are out um, at a university. They have their legs showing. They're wearing um, modern style clothing. Um, I don't know if they've got tights on or not. I don't want to like be too weird about this. <laughs> um, if they don't, they're wearing quite short skirts. If they do, they're kind of trying to cover their legs as well in some way. And I think this girl you can see has pants on as well. So the problem here, oh, there's another picture of students in the 19, late 1960s, Iranian students, um, similar to People here in the U.S., women are wearing pants and similar shoes. Men have long, shaggy hair, as do the women. Um, not not that much different from, from what we would have seen in this country. The problem is that outwardly, um, Iran was expanding economically. They were modernizing. But a lot of the country was traditional, conservative, and rural. And they did not like these changes. So you can see here a group of conservative women protesting um, some of these changes. And they're holding up a picture of the man who eventually would be in charge. All of these women are are wearing the veil to sort of different degrees. So to zoom in again, um, a little bit of hair showing here, but not with this woman. This woman's wearing it in a little bit more of a conservative way. And the younger girl has it on as well. So a lot of the conservative individuals in the country, you know, religiously, they feel like they're being oppressed because the, the Shah is forcing upon them some of these westernized changes um, in their view. And also, at the same point, you have people who are being oppressed. If you are going against the Shah or speaking out against him, you're imprisoned. And we see this in our book. Um, So during the revolution, a return to conservative values is enforced. Rights for women are taken away. Um, Committees are enforcing a dress code that force women to wear the veil, the hijab. Um, Child centers and women centers were closed. Family planning was abolished. The laws about divorce and the right to vote were repealed. And um, for a a while, another great book about this is um, Reading Lolita in Tehran. For a while, women were also not allowed to go to university or to teach at the universities. Now, some of this has been changed since then, but you can see this picture here after the revolution, how different it is from these pictures here, right? A lot more conformity, um, the longer Cador type veil. I think that's the name for it. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I apologize. Um, Extramarital sex and adultery become punishable offenses. Punishments can include fines, imprisonment, flogging, and execution by stoning. So we see some of that in the book. According to Iran's new constitution, all civil, penal, financial, 
economic, administrative, cultural, military, political, and other laws and regulations must be based on Islamic criteria. So a large difference from the rules under the Shah. The thing is that the Iranian Revolution, also known as the Islamic Revolution, so a lot of people, especially I think Westerners, believed that this is... (laughs) I love this punk is not dead, but it's spelled wrong. Um, it's a scene from the book where she's being forced to um, change her clothing by these women who are part of one of those committees, the, the, the real fashion police. At any rate, a lot of Westerners thought that the revolution was just led by Islamic extremists. In fact, that was really not the case. And the book fully depicts this story of what exactly was taking place. In fact, the movement against the monarchy was supported by a lot of different groups. There were some leftist groups, some liberal groups, um, some communist socialist groups, and then there were some other organizations, a lot of socialist student movements as well. But the primary group was... um, the, the, were the religious extremists. So basically what happened is that after this revolution in 1979, Iran was in crisis. You know, you just don't know what might have happened, except that in the 1980s, I think in 1980, just after the revolution, Iraq invaded Iran, setting off a war that would last for eight years. So with all of these different factions vying for power, um, essentially the religious extremists come up and they have now a cause. They have Iran to fight against, or I'm sorry, Iraq to fight against. And that is when the Ayatollah Khomeini and his supporters crush rival factions, defeat local rebellions, they consolidate power, and they are the ones eventually who are in control. And again, you know, I'm not completely really a historian, but I do want to give you an overview of some of this, um, what was going on. So Iraq invades Iran, starting a war which lasts for eight years. So to me, what's interesting about this book is that this is the first part of the book. Uh, The second part of the book, I think, picks up maybe at the tail end of the Iran-Iraq war. So we really get to see these events from the point of view of a child and and then later a teenager. Um, In some ways, because of what's going on, Margie grows up quite quickly. Um, And obviously she's intelligent. So cognitively, we'll talk about that more later. Um, But it's really fascinating. Number one, if you don't know much about what happened in Iran and you're from the United States or another country, you just kind of um, weren't familiar. But it's this very interesting um, recounting of history from a woman who lived through it as a child and what she was thinking and feeling as a child. So it's a really nice way to to end our course. Is it young adult or new adult? Well, here's one of Margie's transformations. She's giving herself a makeover and this is how she thinks of herself before and here's how she is after. The next part after this, she starts doing aerobics and it's kind of a, a funny little scene. But the book begins when she's five and ends when she's a about 23. As I said, some of the scenes take place when she's a child, but it's not a book for younger children. However, I wouldn't say that it's exactly a book for adults either. And I I do think that it could be young adult or new adult, um, high school or college, or, you know, just a tiny bit after. And certainly adults really enjoy the books, particularly people who are interested in history and learning about other cultures. The subject matter is graphic. There are depictions of sex and violence. Um, Not really um, drawn sex, though. So you don't have to worry. If you're worried about that, don't. But there are discussions about sex. There are depictions of violence, um, the horrors of war, living away from home for the first time, losing your virginity, getting married. All of these things are dealt with. You know, what's interesting, though, is that I have not known of this book to be challenged. And it could be because... 
by this point, maybe parents don't do that as much. Also, it's not a book that is in middle school libraries. Like the giver sometimes can end up in a middle school library. You're not going to have that with Persepolis. Um, I don't think too, I have known many college teachers who have assigned this book. Again, because it is kind of a new adult book, I've not known many high school teachers who have assigned it. So that could also be why maybe it just hasn't kind of made its way to high school curriculum for the most part. So it could be in some high school classrooms, but again, um, I've known probably three or four people in college who've taught the book. Um, Margie's life as a young married woman, some of the subject matter might be a bit controversial for high school, but it's a good crossover book and for young adults who are reluctant readers, if they're in high school, I think they're drawn to graphic novels just kind of by default. Um, and if you have never read a graphic novel, I am providing a resource for you for that, by the way, um, how to read a graphic novel. So kind of how to go through the panels and, and how to do that. But um, but younger readers are sometimes drawn to comic books and graphic novels and graphic biographies. Um, so it can help that way, too. But yeah, young or new adult, it, it's kind of will be up for you to decide. Cognitive development. So we have a little scene here. Um, Margie, I think at this point, maybe eight, nine, ten, somewhere around there. Her mother is going to a protest. Her father says, no, it's too dangerous. And her mother says she should start learning to defend her rights as a woman right now. Since the 1979 revolution, I'd grown older, well, a year older, and my mom had also changed. The book is graphic, but the characters are round and complex, as is the plot. We have a much larger cast of characters here than we've had in previous books. We have subplots, we have multiple settings, um, and again, it spans quite a long period of time. What's interesting to me, intellectually, Margie does not seem like a child. It could be because the author was advanced for her age, or it could be because we're reading a memoir which is being written by an adult. So the author's memory of herself might not be entirely accurate. It is a true story, but she's trying to recreate some of the scenes that happened in her childhood. And a lot of times you have to take some artistic liberties if you're doing that. So I don't know. I, I think that there are some things that happen in the first couple chapters of this book where I'm like, really? Like, would a five or six year old say that? Would a 10 year old actually do that? I, I don't know. I have some hesitation, but it's something I'd like for us to talk about in some of our discussions. Um, yeah, again, more like a child, more like an adult than a child. Thinks, think about how she speaks, how she interacts with others. Her parents, yeah, but other adults as well. Um, she spends some time with other adults, including her grandmother, um, other aunts and uncles, neighbors, and then some of her peers. But in some ways, she's like a kid kind of playing war games without really understanding what she's doing. And in other ways, she seems to have kind of a grasp of some philosophers that most people have not heard of. And then watch to see how she matures cognitively. So she moves from being a, a child to a tween to a young adult and then into adulthood. How do her ideas move from black and white thinking to understanding the intricacies of life? How does she view the revolution? How does she view gender roles? Um, how does she come to a more mature understanding of the world beyond just this is a book that I heard my parents talking about and I'm going to parrot it back to you? And then lastly... Watch for how trauma interrupts her cognitive and emotional social development. We talked about this with Joey Pigza um, and a little bit with the other books for our last unit. Um, the Watsons go to Birmingham. Certainly, Kenny goes through tr a traumatic period. Um, Paul faces some trauma because of things that happened in his family. But here... I don't want to say that it's more real because, you know, especially with Joey some of the, and, and Kenny, some of the things that they're going through are very real. Certainly um, similar, though, here, uh, some comparisons to the trauma that Kenny goes through seeing the church bombing. Margie also sees um, buildings being bombed. She also sees children being killed. But there's a lot more trauma, I guess, or 
Yeah. There's a lot more trauma and throughout the book, not just one incident. So some of the things that she faces in Vienna, being out on the streets, being homeless, um, dealing, using drugs and alcohol to kind of numb her emotions, um, all of that. It, it, I want you to watch to see how that affects her because cognitively um, she reacts to things sometimes almost like a younger kid would, even when she's an adult. Emotional development. Here's just one scene, uh, again, on page, right? We see what this looks like. She and her mother are walking past a building that has been bombed. We also have this um, depiction of a theater that was locked um, and then set on fire. Again, it's it's very difficult for me to even talk about these things. So you can imagine a child going through this and, and seeing these um, incidents occur or hearing about them. So emotionally, because of this, Margie struggles through mixed emotions at a very young age. In her young adult years, she's depressed, angry, rebellious, and pushing against adults and other authority figures. Again, part of that is her personality. She's a strong-willed woman. Um, part of it is because the trauma that she's been through, her confusion and comes out in anger and lashing out at people. But really look to see how she depicts these authority figures. Um, I didn't get too much here into unreliable narration, but unreliable narration in this case not like our other books where it's just from the point of view of a child. Here we have an adult kind of recounting events from the past. And in some instances, they might be trying to put themselves in a better light than than what actually happened at the time. I kind of wonder, I've seen the author talk since then, and I wonder if she had written this when she was a little bit older, if she would have... Um, maybe portrayed some of those adult authority figures in a different way, but maybe not. Maybe it is accurate. It just seems that there's a pattern in there with Margie and authority figures and, and what they say to her and what she says back to them and how they treat her and how she in turn treats them. Many teens make decisions with the future in mind. Margie seems to act kind of impulsively sometimes. Um, she's making emotionally driven decisions, sometimes putting her health or her life at risk. And I think that's because of the, the revolution and the war that she's living through. It's very difficult to think about the future when your safety is in jeopardy at all times. So issues of safety and security. As I said before, turning to drugs and alcohol to numb and manage her emotions. Um, but this self-medicating just leads to more trauma. And she feels conflicted when it comes to the extremist um, changes in her country. What I mean by this is <sighs> there are things that happen that she can't fully comprehend. Some things she questions, especially with her teachers, um, as the curriculum changes. You know, you have a teacher who tells you that the Shah is wonderful. The next day, that same teacher is telling you that the Shah is um, full of crap and that he's horrible. Um, but watch for some of those conflicting emotions and how she deals with them. Her sexuality seems also confused. She's living in a very repressed society, so she's almost using her sexuality to kind of break out of that repression, but at the same time, she's making sexual decisions that she doesn't seem really ready for and sometimes that she doesn't even seem to really want. So going out with certain people, um, getting in deeper into a relationship, getting married, all of these are emotionally complicated things. And it's interesting because in the first person, we really get what was going through her mind at that time. Also, how she treats the veil. Uh, the veil is kind of a symbol of the fundamentalist society that has come upon her. So she's forced to wear it, but her friends are possibly wearing it because they want to or because you know, they didn't grow up in a Western country where they had the freedom to choose whether or not to wear it. So a lot of person versus self conflict here and completely reflecting the changes that that young adults are going through as they're in their teenage years and then beyond. Social development. Um, this is 
a little clip here of Margie talking to a friend and obviously they're quite younger at this point. Her father died. Her friend's father died. And she says, your father acted like a genuine hero. You should be proud of him. And the girl says, I wish he were alive and in jail rather than dead as a hero. Um, in her younger years, Margie has some friends and she has playmates but <clears throat> while some of the friendships she makes are deep um, a lot of them are not they're kind of superficial and short-lived she bounces around from place to place as a young child she in Persepolis part one she does not really have a problem as much interacting with children and adults unless those adults are authority figures like teachers. Um, but when she moves from Iran to Austria, she has trouble fitting in with peers and her new surroundings. At one point, she connects with a group of outcasts, but her relationships with these people seem really more on the fact that they're outcasts and that they're drinking and doing drugs as opposed to having actual shared interests. When she moves back from Austria, she returns to Iran. Um, she's again isolated and doesn't fit in with her peer group there. So there are things that they do that she does not understand. Um, even like typical things like they want to go shopping and she wants to talk about deep subjects. Again, she does find her romantic partner, but what I want you to watch here is how they interact. Um, she talks about their relationship and how they're almost codependent on each other. And so you have someone here in Margie who's really struggling to figure out who she is. She's been trying to rebel to find her identity. And now she gets with this partner and her identity kind of becomes like intermingled with his but not necessarily in a healthy way. Eventually, she strives, essentially, <laughs> sorry, essentially, she strives for healthy social ties. Um, because of her inner conflict, because of the trauma, she has trouble sustaining social ties. And this is even true of her friends and or of her family members. They kind of drift in and out of her life. So watch for how she, um, watch for her relationship with her parents and her grandmother what kind of a relationship do they have um, what kind of relationship do they have when she's young how does that change when she's older and how are they absent through most of her life so I talked about this in the last book um, in the last lecture rather um, Joseph Campbell's monomyth Again, if you missed that, Joseph Campbell was a scholar who studied mythology. Um, but I know that this is not a mythological book, but I think we do still see this pattern. Um, there is a call um, to maybe be different um, than some of the other people in her society. And certainly in Persepolis too, when she leaves Iran, crossing that first threshold, how does she commit to it? How does she resist? What challenges does she go through? Um, what is her supreme ordeal? Um, to me, that is, she, she is out on the streets and homeless. She becomes sick. Um, after that illness, she does have sort of a rebirth. And then how does she go through almost a final death and rebirth when coming to Iran again? And then after she returns to Iran, what are some of her challenges and what happens in the end? I do think that you really can see this hero journey in her story. So look for some of these points, particularly, um, you know, I talked with the giver a lot about that call to adventure and the road to trials here the supreme ordeal the transformation what happens to her how is she reborn and then how does she have more trials and challenges and temptation here is our excerpt oh, if i can erase the slide no i cannot great okay um the regime had understood that one person leaving her house while asking herself, are my trousers long enough? Is my veil in place? Are they going to whip me? Can my makeup be seen? No longer asks herself, where is my freedom of thought? Where is my freedom of speech? 
What's going on in the political prisons? My life, is it livable? I think that this, like just these two panels, um, this is after she's returned to Iran. And just these two panels really show the, uh, <clears throat> some of the societal conflict going on here. Um, and also the fact that she um, has some inner turmoil as well. And I want to say <clears throat> it's not it's not the um, it's not the clothing requirements and it's not the religion in and of itself. It's the the way that these were put upon the people during the revolution and after and the way that they are being oppressed. So things to consider. <laughs> this is I love that um, getting things off the black market to listen to ABBA. The world building here, um, what is the world like that she lives in? How does that world change? And how does she deal with conflict, person versus self, and then person versus society as that world changes? There are some person versus person conflicts here, little skirmishes along the way um, in this big cast of characters that we have, but not really as much as the other two. Intimate first person narration. We are really really getting to know her on quite an intimate level. We know her thoughts and her feelings, and we see a lot of the events from a child's point of view and then from a teenager's point of view. The developmental changes in part one as Margie grows from a child to a teenager, and then again in part two as she matures from a teenager to a young adult, and then as she goes into adulthood. So I want you to watch for the developmental changes. Really, we've been talking about through the entire semester, but in ex especially the changes that take place as a teenager. So a lot in part two um, as she grows and matures and changes. The way that trauma affects her life and the development that she's going through. And then some of the themes here to watch for, repression, nationalism, education. Um, what does it mean to be educated? What threatens her education? Hypocrisy. There are a lot of people who are part of this new Islamic regime that are quite hypocritical, that do not believe what they are saying and are only saying what they're saying in order to repress other people and to keep themselves safe. Um, injustice, authority and rebellion, gender roles, sexuality, religion versus faith. There's a little bit here in the beginning about faith. We kind of lose that as the rules kind of take over. War, certainly. Freedom, safety, acceptance, isolation. Um, a lot of Margie's story shows her being isolated and really trying to connect to people, which is not unusual for teenagers to go through, but particularly when they've been through trauma, they struggle with that. Um, progress for it versus tradition and then coming of age. Really, this is a coming of age book. So that finishes up this lecture. I hope that you have that you've enjoyed the books that we've been looking at this semester. I really hope that you enjoy this one. I can't wait to read what you think about it. So if you want, if you're done with the class, um, you can still subscribe and get updates if I teach other classes and you just want to kind of watch along and read some of the books I talk about great. Um, if you're watching this for the first time and you want to know what I mean when I talk about Joey or Tangerine or the Watsons or any of the other books I've mentioned, um, feel free to click on the playlist and you can see all of those lectures as well. That's it, guys. I can't wait to read what you think about this book and I look forward to seeing your work. Thanks. Have a great day.